Don't try to take one. Marker. First, I want to introduce our moderator, Mark Comstock. Mark is a local actor, director, and producer, and he is also the SAG AFTRA local president. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to end off the day with this amazing film. So without further ado, we have our moderator, Mark. Hey. So this is, but this is the one time everyone can see my Hamlet. Um, first of all, how great is it just to see a local film here with our friends, and it'd be so great. You know, I got, to, I got to screen it before, and I watched it by myself in my living room, and it is a totally different experience getting to see it with, with an audience uh, and knowing that Doug and Kristen were sitting right in front of me. Let's talk about the beginning. Like, what, what inspired you, Doug, to, to do this? And how did it all come together? And talk a little bit, too, about uh, your work with Philip, too, and how that all came together. It came out of deep, deep depression is where this came from. <laughs> Was it four days you locked yourself in your office? Yeah, so I think I had gotten, I think I, have, I was pinned for a role in Better Call Saul, and then they told me that I wasn't going to get the part because I was too good. And that so hurts. I cried a lot. I went into my office for like three or four days, and I wrote the script in four days. So. Wow. Uh, are you a uh, final draft or like longhand? Um, with the computer. Yeah, word processor. I downloaded something. And uh, did you do any rewrites? All in the wrong format when I got it. Yeah, yeah, I'd never done this before. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, you have the script. Now what? I mean, what's the most challenging aspect? I mean... I think you know and knew when we talked, which was pre-production, mm -hmm. you said, I'm going to make a film with some friends. Yes, yes, that was <laughs> and, pretty much it, yeah. And then again, you, everybody probably knows that, you know, Chris and I, we own the box, and we do, uh, we have Carver Playhouse, and we have been in these spots before, and a lot of this stuff is kind of like, there were times that I kind of thought, well, maybe if I robbed a bank, maybe I could keep the theater company going. So... <laughs> Well, you so, did yes. have, you know, I know you don't want me to talk about symbolism, but there, tell me about the symbolism. No, um, there were a lot of themes kind of in and out where it was talking about money versus art and culture and what makes a valid uh, contribution to a, to a community. Right. Is it, you know, something for the homeless shelter? What, 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 but theater, as we all know, and the arts do contribute a great deal, debate, empathy, all those things. Was that a message you wanted to kind of come in subtly or was that something because you've lived it firsthand trying to keep the box at times open i think it's like the speech that kristen gave who, who was it was absolutely brilliant Yay. and beautiful and fantastic um she was incredible but that was really the heart of the whole movie um because there are some times that i feel like giving up and quitting but it's like it's, it's really important, so I should keep going. So. And now he just books reoccurring roles. So, I mean, you know, it's no. a big deal. No, no that's not true. It doesn't mean it goes NDAs, back to the theater. NDAs, yeah. So, uh, Keith, how, how did you get on board as a producer? Wait, before I, I give that to you, can I tell you? Oh, yeah, sure. So, let me answer it, and then I'll let Keith answer. But really, Keith was <laughs> brought to me, and a lot of this would not have happened if it wasn't for my agent, Carissa Mitchell, who... <laughs> who is tenacious, she is just vicious. And she's like, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. I'm going to make money off all my actors. You're going to hire them. And really, she had her think. She's like, you know, I have, all, I have all these great actors, and it would be great. And she just kept talking about, it's going to be something for the real. There's something for the real. So she, was, she really was the driving force that made me do this, she made me be in it, and she brought Keith. Yes, so I was lucky enough that I was invited to a table read 
So I always say yes to a table read. And because I wanted to stretch my acting ability, I read that it was like a snarky gay guy, and I was like, oh, to stretch. You know, I, I mean, watched the range some British, you show. The range I watched some show. British comedies. I felt pretty good, and then I guess they liked me. It, yeah, so it just kind of worked out. And then we didn't know how to make a movie. Mm -hmm. So I, I read a couple of books like Producer to Producer and So You Want to Make a Movie and whatever else. But really, what I, when I read it, I was kind of like, I used to plan weddings at my hotel in New Orleans. If I can plan a wedding with a bridezilla, we can schedule a movie. And Doug, being that his schedule's so open, gave us 10 days that we could do this. 10, 10 days, 10. Yeah, well, what was uh, some of the other challenges you had? Doug, you had a lot of uh, one shots in there. Mm -hmm. Was that to kind of keep the pace or as far as like the shooting schedule simple or what was your creative process for that? That came out of the fact that if this was supposed to be and I do believe that it is a love letter to theater. And I thought that if we're going to make a movie about theater, then we should shoot it in a theatrical way with no cuts, uh, with it being like a play. Um, and so we put all the actors together in one dressing room. Um, we had them memorize all their lines, and that's why I did it that way. Um, everybody told me not to do it that way. Everybody told me not to make this movie, uh, and these were all people that were smart. The people that were smart and they knew what they were talking about were like, don't do this. So, But one thing I do want to just note, I don't know if anybody noticed this, because maybe you did, I don't know. But Gus, my character, is you guys in the theater community, who's always there, always there whenever there's a roadblock. The Gus was Carissa, Gus was Chris, Gus was Janae, Anne, all of the people in theater that keep things going when you, it's going to stop. And so it was very funny that Gus always had a plan or could pull something out of his pocket, but Gus is really that supporting community uh, the, Sound, sounds like yeah. someone who might be speaking right now. Yes. So, and then again, I've got Chris here, who wrote the music, uh, yeah. who who bit, who bit scored the movie. The award yes, Chris has won a few awards from other festivals for the soundtrack. The so, the well, it's a score or soundtrack score. So, well, you know that last song is kind of an earworm, right? I mean, it, you're just like it sticks with you, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so. It was kind of a Gus moment that brought Chris to us. So I don't. Know. Yeah, Chris. What when they approached you? What was your, and you read the script? What were your first thoughts? Uh, it was eerily based on a theater company that uh, I, I've had a lot of experience being in a theater company in Albuquerque doing forty-eight hour film festivals, and so it was it was really uh, hit close to home. And I was very excited to, to always work with Doug. And uh, uh, yeah, that was really exciting. Yeah, so we were just we were talking about how it's a steady cam one shots throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. um, what was your editing process then, uh, and and the things that you could fix and you attempted to fix and mm -hmm. you felt were were salvageable from the take that was ninety nine percent there? Um, we didn't have any options because we shot it like way. But that would probably be a question for Air uh, for um, Phil, we who is not one here. Actor. Who ran away in the Neil Van Tatum, who didn't leave the room. Who stopped running and didn't go through the door. <laughs> so Phil did do quite a bit of things. And then, um, and again, Phil's not here, who really was, again, another was brought to us by a Gus. That's Basil, and that's Phil. But, and Phil's not dead. No, no, Basil. Basil's dead, but. He's Phil's dead to me, not. but that's another story, yeah. Phil's not. Yeah. Phil just couldn't be here tonight. But that would be something for Phil. I mean, he did a great job of, uh, of spicing things together. We had built in, I'm sure you saw, when we kind of panned by some stuff, you know, uh, to kind of go to another shot. But uh, that very, very last shot w was actually one whole shot. But we still minutes, planned uh, that sweep. But it, we didn't edit that sweep, even though it went past. Who was the prankster on the set? Who was the what on the set? Prankster. Okay, that would have to be Keith, because I was not going to deal with any pranksters, right? I, I was good. No, everybody. Yeah, they were good. I don't think we had any pranksters. Everybody was pretty, pretty much on 
we best all thing, BS. though, was Basil Hoffman, who tells us, Keith, I, I never eat on set. I just, I'm going to sit in my, my chair. Carissa, could you get me some nachos? Uh, maybe some of the, do you have some more popcorn? So, yeah, he's probably the biggest liar on set, but he, it was with love. I, I was going to ask about rehearsals for the long takes and how much time you devoted to each of those. So there was, uh, we did a couple of days, again, we only had 10 days to shoot it, but a couple of those days were just rehearsal with the camera without shooting, and then we did figure out, like, it was best to kind of just talk into the cameraman's ear, explain to, even though we rehearsed his movements and rehearsed the uh, actors around him, uh, we were still talking in his ear and explaining who's going to have, like, the next line and stuff like that, so. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> did you guys, like, improv a lot um, on set? Like, we're... Um, I think that probably around 5% of the lines were improvised because um, we were very clear that if they were missing a line, if they were forgetting a line, we're like, just improvise, but do not stop. So there was uh, a few improvised lines. I'm not I'm sure if there's a lot, but there wasn't a lot. There wasn't a lot of improvised. Also, when is your next movie coming out? Good question. Good question. Because that was amazing. Okay, so truth be told, when I did this movie, like I said, Carissa uh, was very adamant about me finishing this movie and was very pushy and forceful. And I said, I'm going to do it, but I'm never going to do another one ever again. I'm going to do this, and then we're going to go back to Children's Theater, and that's what we're doing. But there have been a few moments, and I'm, I've decided that uh, I'm going to lock myself away for the next three or four months, and I'm going to write another movie. Yeah. Yes! Woo. So can we um, That's good pencil you in for this time next year? Yes, let's do it. No, let's yeah. do it. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah, so yeah, I guess that, no, I'll keep, I'll keep directing. Okay. We'll keep doing kids show, but but yeah, um, I have uh, I'm definitely going to set myself away from everybody for a little while and uh, see what I can do. So that's well, great. On that note, first, thank you, Albuquerque Film Mexico News Media Experience. Yes, thank you for getting us this beautiful place to be sponsored at. Uh, I understand the party is continuing at Bar Roma, which is Central and Wellesley. Um, so if you want to hit Keith up to produce your film, Chris to write something for it, and then Doug to write you a part, I'm right here. Um, meet us at the bar and talk some more, and thank you all for coming out and supporting New Mexico Film. <laughs>